friends, welcome back. I'm Mark Baker, and in today's broadcast, we're going to continue talking about the subject that we're calling One Mediator. In the previous two programs, we've looked at quite a bit, and if you haven't joined us before, I encourage you to go back and look at the previous episodes and catch up with us. We've looked at Moses' intercession in Exodus chapter 32 for the nation of Israel, We've talked about Jesus being our mediator and how Jesus was lifted up and drew all judgment unto himself. Now, as we're moving forward in this program, before we get started, I want to remind you, I've mentioned it before, but just remind you and just ask that you would continue to pray for our team. We are finalizing our second book, The Holy Spirit and the Incorruptible Seed, in a projected release in August of this year. So just, I ask you just to keep our team in prayer as we finalize it, finish the final editing, finish the final, you know, formatting. And we look forward to releasing this book and and believe it's going to be a great blessing to you and to many around the world. As we get into our study today, let's go ahead and ask the Holy Spirit for his help. Because Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come to teach us, to guide us, to lead us. So Holy Spirit, I thank you for each person joining me today. I thank you for leading them to this video. I thank you for your teaching ministry. We yield to you. We yield to you and thank you for revealing Jesus ever and ever clearer to us. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, I thank you for each person precious person that's going to be joining me watching this program. I pray that the eyes of the understanding be open, that the, they'll be given a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, and just get a clearer picture of him in his ministry standing between us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our text is in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We start in verse 1, it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I said in the last broadcast that when you look at this word mediator in the Greek, it's a go-between, somebody that stands between us and God. It is covenant language. In the new covenant, Jesus sealed this covenant and all the promises that are given to us in him with his blood. He is the go-between between between humanity and God. If you look at the Greek in the original languages, that word mediator actually gives a picture of one who has been tasked with guaranteeing that the promises, the provisions of the covenant come to pass, manifest. He is the guarantee of that covenant language. The Bible tells us that he sent the Holy Spirit as the first fruits of our redemption, our redemption that is promised within this covenant. Jesus is our go-between. I mentioned looking at Moses' ministry in Exodus chapter 32, where he stood between Israel and God instill God's wrath, that a lot of times we use that and we use Genesis chapter 18 where where Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah as our foundation to teach intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is still a valid ministry, but it is much different in the New Covenant, because in the Old Covenant, they did not have anyone to stand between them and God. Moses stepped into that place. Abraham stepped into that place. 
But today we do not step into that place because that is where Jesus stands. That is his ministry. And for us to say we need to stand in the gap, we need to stand between God and this situation or between God and this person. Do you think that in a sense what we're doing when we do that is saying Jesus is not enough? But wait a minute, you say, didn't it say in our text, intercessions for all men? Yes, if you go up to verse 1, I exhort therefore that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. This word intercession that is used here is not like the intercession that was given by Moses. So if you look at it in the original language, we're looking at a place of intersection between God and the earth. That is spirit initiated. That is much different. We're talking about taking a place in prayer to provide an intersection between heaven and the earth. But that place of prayer is spirit initiated. We call for intercessory prayer meetings. Who's initiating that meeting? When you look at the old timers, and this is something we're going to look at, and we're going to get more in depth in this and look at it. You will read these people who are used in intercession Talk about being moved upon to pray for a specific situation. They were moved upon by the Spirit of God. Now, what I found is true intercession comes from the Spirit. It is Spirit-initiated, which is what the sense you get with this Greek word that was used here for intercessions. As you pray, and we looked at this in the previous series in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 it talks about presenting ourselves living sacrifices in the altar we yield our tongues to the spirit of God we're bypassing the soul we're speaking forth the language of our spirit with our tongues as we're doing that we're allowing the eternal flame to flow outward in the outer court which in the new testament in second corinthians and first corinthians Chapter 3, you'll see that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The outer court consists of our physical being. In the Old Covenant, the brazen altar where the burn offering was brought was in the outer court. We yield our tongues and we speak forth the utterance provided by the Spirit of God. We are allowing the eternal flame to flow outward from the Holy of Holies, which is our spirit, where the presence is, and consume the sacrifice upon the brazen altar. The new covenant sacrifice, as we see in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, is our self, our des desires, our plans, we allow them and we place ourselves on the, on the altar and allow the fire of God to burn that away. It is not that it's not right to have plans or goals or anything like that. But as your desires decrease, his desires will replace them. When it talks about for example, in Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, Jesus said, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have whatsoever you pray for. I believe that what happens is we are not seeing verses like that come into manifestation because we are presenting our desires to God without putting them on the altar. You will find the more time you spend praying in tongues, the less your selfish desires will manifest and the more his desires will begin to manifest through you. 
He has a plan for each one of us, friend. And he didn't leave you here alone to walk that plan out. You're not here hopeless, helpless, or anything like this. Everything we're talking about is good news. He sent the Holy Spirit to guide you, to lead you. And as you yield to that, and it's, it's so amazing because get left to ourselves, we're only going to pray selfish desires. We're only going to pray from self. In John chapter 20 and verse 22, it says Jesus breathed into the disciples. And then in Acts chapter 1, he told them to wait, wait for the promise. Now, we don't see people waiting today as they did back then because it was not until the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came. You can go into Acts chapter 10. You'll find in Cornelius' house, Peter came in, first Gentiles that were preached to, the Holy Spirit fell, they received salvation, they received their prayer language all at the same time. The waiting of Acts chapter 1 was due to them needing to wait until the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and that eternal flame was lit. They had already received the Holy Spirit in their spirit, but they needed to have that conduit, that eternal flame lit. Just as God in the Old Testament, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we see where the fire came down and lit the eternal flame in the, in the temple. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and lit that flame within us and enabled that conduit to begin flowing. But then he gives us the ability to speak forth the language of the Spirit from our spirit. It's interesting, and I think we should go over there just really quick in Romans chapter 12. And I know we've looked at this quite a bit in these broadcasts, but it's something that we just need to really be thinking about. Because like I said, you don't need to be discouraged by all this because this is all very good news. We have not been interpreting Scripture correctly. As we start looking at Scripture, start understanding the ways of the Spirit of God, we're looking at opening the door to the glory. The Holy Spirit wants to use you in these ways. And that's why he sent, sends forth teachers like myself to help you look at the Word, to give you the encouragement to close yourself off with him, to spend time with him. Because, friend, he has a wonderful plan for you, and he desires for you to walk in the power of God. Not just for you to attend meetings where other people are walking in the power and the flow of the Spirit of God. He wants you to walk in that and walk in the fullness of his plan for your life. He desires that for you, friend. But you must be willing to pay the price to offer that sacrifice to spend the time with him. And as you yield in prayer, you'll find yourself diminishes and he begins to rise. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Notice the order here. I've talked about the difference between acquired and revelation knowledge in previous broadcasts. Acquired knowledge is knowledge we gain our own effort. It is knowledge gained through self-effort. Revelation knowledge, on the other hand, is imparted by the Spirit of God. You see, the Holy Spirit knew that you and I could not do this by ourselves. So what God did is he sent the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus. The Holy Spirit, when we made Jesus the Lord of our life, and if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's just a matter of believing your heart and confessing with your mouth. Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into our spirit. And then the Spirit lit that eternal flame, and in Acts 2 and 4 it says, the Spirit gave utterance, but they spoke. When we receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in, we have the ark, which represents the presence. But then you have the eternal flame. You have that, you know, he, in the first experience, when we're saved, the Holy Spirit immerses us into Jesus. And then in the second experience, Jesus immerses us into the Holy Spirit and the eternal flame is lit. And the first manifestation of the fire is our prayer language. You see, it is not 
transform, you know, be transformed by the renewing your mind and then present yourself on the altar. It's present yourself on the altar as a living sacrifice and then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because without the sacrifice, we only have access to acquired knowledge which will not bring about the transformation God seeks for you and I's life. We present our bodies on the, sac on the altar. We s commit time to yielding to those utterances the Holy Spirit gives us. As we do that, our selfish nature, our selfish desires are consumed by that eternal flame. Opening up that conduit for us then, as we spend time meditating in the Word, to receive that revelation knowledge. And transformation comes through revelation. Pure seeds that have been purified in the fire of the Spirit. The old timers used to call this dying to self. We don't like that term today. That Dying to self is just not a politically appropriate term. But if you want to walk at the level God desires you to walk, and you can, there's nothing holding you back except for yourself. The Holy Spirit's ready to lead you, to guide you. Jesus is calling you up higher. He's given you his authority. He's given you his name. But are you willing to pay the price, to set yourself aside, to become that living sacrifice. Because it is in that sacrifice that we are consumed. And out of the ashes of the offering arise the glory. The glory ascending, arising from the church, the glory flowing outward, touching the earth. The evil manifesting is an expression of the hunger, the hunger not being met by the church. Yielded vessels consumed by the presence can fill that hunger, can take what they desire. Lasting change can only come through him. It is through the blood and through the fire that our selfish desire is consumed and we're pulled into the place of his presence. From within that place, he will begin to move freely and those around us will find his grace. Healings will manifest. The miraculous will become common. They will be drawn to those who have allowed themselves to cons be consumed. Not just those who are burning, but those who have burned to the point of full consumption, where nothing is left but the Savior in that eternal flame moving forth. Friend, there is so much more out there that we have not accessed that God desires for us to walk in. But the question is, what price are we willing to pay in order to access everything that he has for us? We've brought a lot of Old Testament concepts into the New Testament church. We've created this expectation for manifestation for experience. And people are being drawn because of the experience. I'm thinking as I'm talking today about this young lady that Carolyn and I used to know, talking about these meetings she had gone through, gone to. She talked about how the power was just in such manifestation and 
oh, there was such a move of God. And we, we asked her, you know, what had happened? And the reason she knew that the power was manifesting was because she had been glued to the floor and just laughed and laughed and laughed. Am I saying those things aren't real, that they don't happen? No. There's definitely a place where you'll see laughter, where you'll see people running and dancing. But unfortunately, we've made that the destination. What you need to realize is I'm not criticizing these things. What I'm saying is that is just the doorway. When you have become fully consumed, we learn about the things of the Spirit in the laughter, in the running, in the rejoicing. But as you move deeper into the presence, as I've shared on previous podcasts, you will find things become quieter, become still. In Proverbs, we read, Be still and know that I am God. For it is in that stillness we experience the fullness of the glory. It is in that stillness that we find the greatest levels of intimacy. But it is that stillness that most of us have never known. The stillness is a quiet, holy place. It is a place where we come into the very atmosphere of heaven. You will not see people running, dancing, shouting when you move into that place. But how many of us have experienced that? We're just like those people which we read about in the previous broadcast in John chapter 2 that flocked to Jesus' ministry because of the experience. But then Jesus did not join himself to them because he did not know them. If you want to know Jesus and you want to develop intimacy with him, you must learn to be quiet. You must learn just to wait in his presence, with no agenda. And it's simple, friend. This is not something you can't do. I'm not talking about something that's out there for only the Holy of Holies people in the highest level of ministers. It's as simple as just taking time, you know, closing the bedroom door, finding your quiet place, sitting down and saying, Holy Spirit, I'm here. I have the word. I just want to hear what you have to talk, say today. What do you want to talk about? I want to listen to you. And just waiting. Some people, and I do it some, sometimes myself, but some people, we use a journal. We just have the journal open with the empty pages. And the list as a point of focus. And I use this sometimes myself and it does, it's it's a very good tool. But you sit down, what do you want to talk about Holy Spirit? And begin to listen. And as he begins to talk, begin just to write out everything he's talking to you about. That way you can go back and look at it. This is how we learn the things of the Spirit how we learn to access Jesus' ministry as our go-between in this new covenant. Jesus is standing with his blood to guarantee manifestation of the provisions of his covenant. But we do have a part. Just because Jesus is our mediator does not mean we do not have a part. But in Romans chapter 8, it says, those who are sons of God must be led by the Spirit of God. We do have a part, but Jesus knew we could not accomplish that part in our own efforts, in our own strength. So he did not leave us alone. And that's why in John chapter 16, he said it was expedient, better, more profitable for them that he leave so that he could send the other comforter. In other words, one who would operate exactly as he had operated when he walked on the earth. And that other comforter is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that Jesus breathed 
into your spirit, into my spirit, when we made him Lord of our lives. He's the one that Jesus immerses us in after salvation. He's the one that gives us the utterance to speak forth the mysteries, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 too. The mysteries of heaven, the hidden wisdom of God. He comes to enable us, to teach us, to guide us. And he will teach us how to cooperate with Jesus, how to work with Jesus in Jesus' intercessory ministry. You don't need a human being to go between you and God. You don't need a priest, a minister, to stand between you and God. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, You were made accepted in the beloved. God is waiting with arms wide open to receive you into his presence. Are you willing to enter in? That is the question. Are you willing to pay the price to allow him to consume you, to consume your desires? Jesus is coming soon. We're going to be seeing him in the clouds soon, my friend. And I don't want him to return finding me focused on my desires. I want him to come and find me focused on the affairs of his kingdom. How about you? Our time is up. And as we close out today, I want to remind you, MB Media Ministries is growing. Carolyn, I desire that fruit abound to your account. And the Bible tells us that if you're receiving benefit and you're receiving feeding from these broadcasts. It instructs us to sow into those ministries. We have partners who have come alongside us, and we're asking you to pray about joining them. You can go to our website, mbmediaministries.net, and on the front page, you will see a tab that says Give. Pray about what your part is. Regardless of how the Holy Spirit leads you, we covet your prayers, we pray for you, and remember, you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.